Oh, Gavin Dunn, thank you very much for being on the Pay to Play podcast. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome too, um, although I'm uh, a little bit worried about how my uh, web host is going to react. I warned him that um, his servers might wind up melting down. He said, bring it on, but... Uh, oh, really? <laughs> We'll as long as we can hear, as long as we can hear each other, it'll be okay. Yeah. So, um, you are now an internet famous musician, therefore you know, <laughs> famous musician who um, makes songs based on his love of video games. Semi famous. <laughs> I would say semi famous. Can you tell me when the uh, the making music bug first bit? When you you know discovered that uh, being a musician was your thing. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, ever since I kind of picked up a guitar around the age of 14, I've never really wanted to do anything else. Um, I pretty much knew as soon as I played my first couple of chords, wow, this is what I want to do. And I've always stuck with it since then. So when did uh, Miracle of Sound actually start? Miracle of Sound started, hmm, must be going on nearly... Is it almost two years ago now? Maybe about a year and a half. Um, it started just basically. It started with a, a kind of a joke song. Um, I was kind of I was in a lot of bands before, and the the age old cliche of the band who almost made it. You know, we got signed, got a record deal, and as soon as that happened, everything fell apart. <laughs> So I was kind of feeling a little down and dejected over my music career. And I wrote Gordon Freeman Saved My Life um, for a bit of fun to cheer myself up um, because I'd been playing a lot of Half-Life at the time. And I put it on YouTube and the rest is history. It kind of went semi-viral by itself. Now, from the sounds of things, you were actually, before um, Miracle of Sound took off, you kind of been on mm -hmm. the apis there for a little while. On the forum. Yes. Um, yes. Did having that community there kind of help you get things kicked off at the start? I think it did in a big way because um, the Escapist did a news feature on the song when it started picking up views, and I think that kind of pretty much that really helped to set the ball rolling and help it to go kind of semi-viral, you know. Um, and it was nice that, you know, I kind of knew a few members of the Escapist community quite well and they were very supportive about the whole thing and kept the forum on top of the board for a couple of days or kept the post on top of the forums for a couple of days, should I say. So, yeah, it was cool. And it was it was nice then to be able to directly contact the Escapist about becoming a contributor because I already had that, um, as in I already was a member of their community. So it was... I suppose um, it made it easier for me to contact them when I had the idea to maybe become a contributor. You have been doing this now for, as you say, two and a half years. Um, and yeah. you recently made the decision to um, ramp it back a little bit from doing a new song every two weeks to yeah. a new song every month. Um, yes. And I know at one point you did say uh, in a uh, one of the video logs that you did on YouTube that mm -hmm. had been experiencing a little bit of burnout. How would you sum up that experience of doing a song every couple of weeks for, you know, two and a half years? Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say it was hard work in the way that I was kind of exhausted and depressed and tired. I mean, I've worked other jobs which are much harder and I love this work, you know. Um, what I did find difficult, though, was just coming up with new ideas all the time, you know, I, and there's, there's only so many ways you can say things, especially when a lot of the subject matter that I'm writing about has similar stories these days. Um, there's only so many <laughs> times you can rhyme certain words as well. And I was just becoming a little bit, um, I think, I, as I said on Facebook, I think I o slightly overestimated my abilities when I signed up to do a song every fortnight. And uh, the escapists were cool with it. They 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 agreed with me that uh, quantity is a better focus than no quality is a better focus than quantity. Excuse me. But um, I never got to the point where I in any way resented it. You know, I was always loving what I do. It's just sometimes I would get a little stuck for inspiration. I suppose when I was doing so many songs that I would just kind of be sitting there and there were no ideas coming. So I'd end up doing instrumental songs because I couldn't think of any lyrics to write and. I would rather do 12 
amazing songs a year than do 24 and have some of them be mediocre. If there's one thing that I think prevents a lot of people from actually going about engaging with what they love and, you know, making something cool out of it is the common yeah. reason. But I'd love to do it, but I just don't have the time. And, mm-hmm. you know, you've been doing a song every two weeks for a good period. And from what I understand, you also, you have you have a day job. You're still working full time. Is that right? <clears throat> no, Miracle Sound is my full time job now. Ah, okay. there's there's no way in hell I'd have been able to do to write, record, produce, mix, engineer, and master a song every two weeks if I was working full time as well. No way, that's just not possible. Was there a period where you were doing, where you did have to do that juggling act of you know? Um, yes, there, there was a few years back. I was working. Um, I mean, I've done all the jobs musicians do through their lives. I've done washing dishes in hotels. I've done waiting. I I spent a few years working in a record shop in a HMV store, and that was when I was really making a big effort with the music. But uh, that was proper burnout because I'm I've always been an insomniac um, for most of my life um, since I was a little kid. And when you're not sleep when you're working all day long and when you're working all evening long as well you <laughs> you can tend to burn out pretty quickly and I knew I had to give up the um I knew I had to give up working full time for a little while if I was going to make the dream of music a reality so how did you actually make that happen that transition from having the full time job to um yeah becoming a a paid full time musician what was um, well, I went on. I went on social welfare for a while. <laughs> the the musician's wage, uh, and um, you know, I I used that time thankfully to uh, do something constructive, you know. And in the end, I was able to come off the social welfare because I was earning enough money from selling my songs and from my videos on YouTube and the Escapist to be able to make this a full time job. Oh, that's intriguing. I'd, um, you always tend to um, look at the uh, look at the receiving welfare payment situation as something you want mm-hmm. to avoid. But uh, if you do it right, it can be it can be just another stepping stone to getting where you need to be. Exactly, it's a bridge, you know. When you do your recordings, uh, yeah, sort of sitting here in my front room with a gaming headset on. Uh, mm-hmm. in front of my computer with right now I've got a couple of dogs who thankfully aren't making any noise um, yeah. and you pretty much do your recordings um, in your room in your flat as I understand I do indeed yeah out of, you know sheer curiosity what do you have to do in order to make sure that you get good sound quality in your own home now uh, you'd, you'd be amazed how much I get away with <laughs> you know if you if you took apart my songs and um, listened to each part individually, like each vocal, there's a lot of background noise. There's a lot of um, unwanted echo and things. But thankfully, sometimes when I mix it all together, it's masked because there's so much going on in the songs. But, um, you know, I have my little office here. I have some foam on the walls to soak up a bit of sound. And I mix everything on a program called Cubase, which is a, it's a, you know, it's a top of the line studio you know, rec- recording studios don't look like um, you see them in music videos. Recording studios look like a computer now. You know, yeah. They don't look. They don't look like huge desks with loads of buttons all over the place. All your all your knobs and buttons are on the computer screen nowadays. You know, you can have just as good um, recordings with uh, just with software as you used to be able to do with analog gear. I know what you mean. I'm using Audacity to edit my podcasts at home, and mm-hmm. even though the interface looks fairly simple, when you start getting into the menus and all the options that you have there, I start mm-hmm. get feeling that yeah, maybe I need um, uh, a degree in audio engineering to really understand all the options that are available in the darn thing. Yeah, Audacity is a handy little program. Actually, it's great for doing um, like live commentaries over gaming videos and stuff like that got a lot of options actually for a freeware now recently you showed off your brand new guitar yeah <laughs> um, my baby which miracle of sound paid for yes indeed uh, what other sweet kit are you proud to uh, have got your mitts on 
Um, well, I got a Fender Jazz Bass, which was really nice. Um, because one of the things that I felt was always a little bit of a letdown in the Miracle of Sound songs was, well, I, I've always, until the last few months, basically, felt that the sound quality could have been a lot better in so many ways. I mean, I'm talking right now into a very expensive microphone. <laughs> And that has made a massive, massive difference to the songs because, you know, the vocal is the most important part in, in many of the songs and uh, having a good mic makes all the difference. And I was using a crappy one for so long that when I heard the difference the good one made, I was blown away by it. So uh, what else have I got? myself? I just, you know, I put all my money back into pretty much music stuff, except I did spoil myself this year. I bought a gaming PC, but apart from that, I'm pretty frugal. I keep thinking I'll have to invest in a decent microphone set up myself for this. Um, yeah. Like every time I, I buy something really for the studio, it's usually a software, you know? Like um, if I say I got I got a new orchestra today, <laughs> you know, it means I got a new program that lets me play kind of realistic string sounds through the keyboard and record it. Now you are doing Miracle of Sound full time. Uh, what sort yeah. of things have you discovered about scheduling with having all this time to put into it that, you know, uh, having to juggle working with making your music, you know, that you just simply didn't have before. Uh, I love it. <laughs> I really love it. You know, it's, I, I, I consider my job um, a, a luxury almost, you know, because I'm doing something I really enjoy, which is creating music. And at the end of, at the end of, every work session I have something I can put on and listen to, you know, and I, I love it. I, you know, I don't, I, I, my schedule is very all over the place. I can, I can be working till five, six in the morning and then sleep for two hours and then get straight back up and work right through the next day. Or I can do nothing for three days, you know, but usually when I work, it's in very intensive periods and very intensive bursts. So I might do nothing for like three or four days and then I'll spend four or five days just completely, completely into the work. Um, it's uh, a lot of people have <laughs> remarked that it's almost frighteningly obsessive the way I work. And my girlfriend sometimes gets a little bit worried towards the end of uh, particularly difficult songs because I will I will be doing nothing but doing it all the time. Like I'll eat, eat sleep and dream the song until it's finished, you know. <laughs> but I think I think that's essential if you want to create something really good, you know. I think uh, I think a lot of people would would envy you the uh, the time you can just spend chilling out because it's uh, mm. it's a bit of a pain then when you you know when you want to relax but you've you've got other problems mm. you've just got to take care of. Yeah. How did you when you were doing Miracle of Sound on that uh, fortnightly basis how did you fit in the non-gaming songs that sort of came up in the meantime like you know big 10 and she's going to teach you how to rock and roll <clears throat> well like i said it's it gets to the point sometimes where it, it is kind of an obsession and you'll just think about nothing else and do nothing else for a long time you know <laughs> and i don't know you just you it's like any other job i suppose you just knuckle down and you do it you know you you um you make the time for it, you know, because the reward at the end is worth it, I suppose. Mm. At one point, you mentioned that you are a very controlling type. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Recently, things have been changing a little bit. Uh, a while ago, when you did Sweet L.A., um, mm -hmm. collaborated with uh, a jazz pianist and a saxophonist. Uh, yes. You had a backing vocalist on the uh, Prince of Persia song, Back in Time. And yes. then, of course, there was the frankly bloody awesome Legends of the Frost, which you did with Maluka. Uh, with Maluka, yeah. What changed? Were you, in terms of loosening up that iron fist of creative control? Um, I wouldn't say anything changed, really. I just think uh, every so often it's nice to do something different, you know. I, I still have no intentions of a full-time band ever again. Um, uh, or ha letting anyone else have a creative say over my songs in any major way. I mean, you've got to, with, with these songs like Sweet L.A. and Legends of the Frost, uh, I still wrote every note in those songs exactly how I wanted it, you know. Um, but actually, funny enough, um, Maluka is a very talented producer and arranger. 
And much to my surprise, she actually came up with a lot of the things you hear in that song. And at first I was I was um, at first I kind of went, oh, she's changing things. Hmm. And the more I listened to what she had done, I was like, this really works. So, you know, sometimes you just listen to something and if it works, you you um, you will go with it. You know, because there's a there's a huge difference between wanting to control out of ego and wanting to control because you want quality. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of people in bands are very controlling over the other band members because it's all about ego for them. And I think we all go through that. Musicians all go through that in our kind of late teens, early twenties. I've been through it as well. We all want to be the front man. We all want to have our solo be the loudest thing on the the record. But I think when you get to my age, around thirty, you kind of um, you look at music in a different way and you just want what's best for the song and what works best, you know. So if someone does come up with an idea that you really like, I mean, I'm not going to say no. I'm going to go, yeah, that's awesome. You know, I, there, you have to separate your ego from the creative process, I suppose, as pretentious as that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Maluka is extremely talented at arranging and producing. So, yeah, she had some great ideas, so we used them. Well, the results were definitely spectacular. Um, you know the um, you know her solo section in the middle. Uh, she she came up with that all by herself, and uh, at the very end of the song, we repeat the Kruzik Akrin lines uh, in the background, and she came up with that part as well. So and she kind of made little changes to the melody here and there to suit her own um, her own vocal range. So we actually tried a couple of versions of the song. It was quite different, actually, the first draft of it. But uh, I'm I'm quite happy with how that one turned out. Good. Um, I I know what you mean about the uh, the ego situation, especially as a, yeah. trying to get a novel written, and uh, and that is very much oh, wow, yeah. a solitary endeavour. At least until yeah. you get later in the process when you've got to, you know, put it out there and look at getting an editor in just to get a mm-hmm. pair of eyes over it and get it working. So, uh, yeah, especially... Yeah, and it, it, it can be very difficult the first time you put it out there and people are criticising it. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's something I'm um, looking forward to with a bit of trepidation, but uh, if you don't oh. do it, it, uh, it doesn't get out there and it doesn't get done. Exactly. And if you don't listen to the criticism, you won't get any better, so... I saw an interview with Lionel Richie on uh, when Michael Parkinson was still doing interviews, and he said that he could never predict his own hits. All the songs that he didn't think would make it at all, ones that you know went out out of the park. Yeah. Have you? What's your, been your experience of that? I would feel exactly the same. It's completely, you know, and sometimes it can be like really. Sometimes it can be wonderfully surprising in a good way, and then sometimes it can be very deflating because you'll have this song and you'll think, this is amazing, everyone's going to love this, and then they hate it, and it just sells like two copies, and it's like, wow. (laughs) You know, it does. I actually don't... Let me just look up what are the best-selling songs there. I won't give numbers, obviously, but I will just have a look and see what is the top sellers. I think Commander Shepard will obviously be the highest seller of all time that I have because it's been out almost the longest and it got the attention from Bioware and stuff. It uh, speaks to everyone's inner interstellar badass. Uh, yeah, and that's that's a funny one actually because uh, when I wrote that one, I thought, hey, you know, it's a fun little song. I'm sure a few people will like it. I had no idea people would like it that much, you know. Um, okay, let me see. Yeah, Commander Shepard is my best-selling song. Take It Back is my second best-selling song. Uh, then Joker's song, Sovereign Guard song, and Legends of the Frost. Uh, I, yeah. uh, I actually told a friend of mine that I was going to be interviewing you yesterday. And I yeah. sent him out to um, your channel on The Escapist. And... Uh, uh, he saw Joker's song and played it, and for the rest of the day, I could not get it out of bloody. <laughs> really? <laughs> so I found myself just singing the chorus over, over and over. Bloody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was that was one of the ones I had a good feeling about while making it. Actually, mm. yeah, some of the more some of the more um, 
some of the very unpopular songs are ones that I've really loved myself, which I think is funny. Like, um, I really enjoyed Brothers of the Creed when I was making that. I loved it, and it was like my favorite one. And then everyone just slated it when it came out. I was like very disappointed. But, you know, that's that's part of it, you know, and you use the information to think, how can I improve the next time? And I think the second Assassin's Creed song, um, Shadows in the Moonlight, I took all the criticism of the first one on board mm-hmm. and used it to make the second song better, you know? Yeah, I um, that was a sad thing, because when I first heard Brothers of the Creed, um, I quite enjoyed it, and I still do. But yeah. um, I think that what helps is that I'm not a huge Assassin's Creed fan, so... I wonder if it well, would, people who don't you see this, this. This is where I got really frustrated with some of the criticisms of the song because a lot of the criticism came from people who'd only played the second game and who'd never played the first one, uh-huh. and who didn't feel that the Middle Eastern um, kind of Arabic music scales fit with the atmosphere of the game. Ah. Uh-huh. Which made me really pissed off because I was like, you know, well, you know, did you play the first one? It was set in the Middle East. The entire history of the the Brotherhood is, you know, based in the Middle East, hence the Arabic scales. But uh, just, you know, sometimes people just don't want to listen. But most of the criticism you get is is good, you know, and you can use it to make make yourself better in the future, I think. It's easy sometimes when you look at a person's success to sort of envy um, no doubt the amount of work that went into it but you sort of occasionally you feel like you know this person uh, you think of them as a self-made success and looking yeah. at them from the outside and all the things they've sort of done they've you know done on their own with squared shoulders and indomitable will and you, know, you sometimes feel like how the hell can a mere mortal like me do that but um People, I guess, they don't sometimes realise the network of people who are behind every success. Um, we talked about the people in The Escapist a little bit earlier on, but um, who were some of the other people who, you know, when things maybe got a bit tough, were there to help you out? And who were the people, you know, you you would want to recognise if you had the chance? Do you mean on a professional or personal level? Um, heck, all of the above, because I think, you know, sometimes... It's it's good to have professional help, and you know, sometimes just the people in your life who maybe aren't directly connected to your thing can yeah. help you out in in different ways entirely. Um, well, I suppose the biggest help to me has been my girlfriend. Really, you know, she's amazing, and she helps me out more than anyone else. So <laughs> she always makes sure I eat, remember to eat and sleep when I'm working. <laughs> and you know, she kind of. Um, was very encouraging when I was kind of at my lowest point musically and not going anywhere and had the faith in my abilities to push me to keep going and believed in me. And it sounds awful cliche, but it's true, you know. Um, professionally, I, you know, there's the escapist. Um, but mainly I've kind of done all this by myself, you know. I set up my own YouTube channel and I set up my own... Bandcamp and everything. I don't have a record label. I don't want a record label because that's kind of been a disaster in the past. So, yeah, it's pretty much a one-man show. <laughs> God, now you're making you're definitely making all the rest of us mere mortals feel, you know, inadequate. <laughs> no, it's it really is just you know, it's like any other job. The hard, the more hard work you put in, the more you get out, you know. Mm, mm. And I will say, you need a bit of luck as well. I think you know. I've definitely had quite a lot of luck, you know, to find to find this little niche, you know, to even discover this little niche, I think, was a very lucky thing to stumble upon, you know? Yeah. Well, I think we're coming toward the end, but I don't think we can really finish this without spending at least a couple of minutes talking games. So, yes, what are you digging right at the moment and what are you looking forward to? Uh, okay, I just finished the... What did I finish this week? I finished the Mass Effect Leviathan DLC, which was definitely interesting, but I can't talk about it because it's massive spoilers if I do. But uh, I've been playing a lot of modded Skyrim, actually. Uh, I've been discovering the joys of mods in the last month or two since I got my PC, and wow, they, they really changed the games. I mean, 
my favorite game is Fallout 3. And uh, being able to go back out into the wasteland and see a completely different wasteland in front of me, it's a, it's a lovely experience. <laughs> uh, Sleeping Dogs was great as well. And um, you're playing through, I think, Fall of Cybertron at the moment? Yeah, oh, that game is ridiculously good fun. It's a really, really great game. It's, uh, I, I don't know if you're a Transformers fan at all, are you? <laughs> oh, D. God. Um, <laughs> yeah, Generation 1. <laughs> I um, Transformers pretty much sealed the deal for me in terms of not only being you know, a science fiction fan, but just a fan yeah. of big, shiny, awesome-looking machines. So, yeah. Um, I mean, okay, so we're, we're on the same boat in that one then. <laughs> you know, I played, played War for Cybertron, and um, yeah. yeah, it's sort of like Fall of Cybertron they announced. I thought, oh, God, let's... Of, I'm going to have to juggle the pennies to get see if I can get my mitts. Yeah. It's, I might give it a while. I might wait until, it, you know, a few months up launch and maybe it comes down a little bit before I, I grab it. I'm, um, I'm kind well, Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's very short. And I think it, f- at full price, if you don't have a huge budget, I would say it's worth getting if you're going to play a lot of the multiplayer, which I don't go near. I'm, I'm, I just hate multiplayer. I have a thing against multiplayer in general, but the campaign is quite short. I will admit that. But it's ridiculously fun and you'll want to play it a second time. Yeah, I have a platonic ideal of multiplayer as a place where I can get together with good mates and just sort of, we can, you know, lose ourselves in being badass for a little while. But the reality of multiplayer as it stands, I mean, my Xbox Live subscription ends um, at the beginning of September and I put the money that I sort of had budgeted toward it to uh, buying um, the rule book for the tabletop role-playing game Death Watch instead. I thought, bugger yeah. up, hopefully to have more fun with that. Um, yeah. So I know what you mean, although I, I do feel a bit sad that I'm kind of losing out on the opportunity to um, uh, play Firefight and things like that. But most mm-hmm. friends who I enjoy the company of, I, I don't really see online anyway, so I just thought, look, bugger it. Yeah, exactly. And you, I think mu- multiplayer gaming is fun in small bursts, but I just I have strong feelings about multiplayer in modern gaming, and it's almost becoming an epidemic. And there's so many games that could have had amazing long single player campaigns are being stunted and and messed up because they spent so much time on a half assed multiplayer mode instead, and it just gets under my skin. <laughs> so, um, what are you? Uh, what are you looking forward to? What are you? surfing the gaming channels up and looking at all the previews and going, oh, I must get my bits on this at launch. Hmm, that's an interesting question. I can't. Far Cry 3 looks fun. Um, I thought the second Far Cry was very, very flawed, but it had potential to be amazing. I don't know if you played it or not, but it was an extremely punishing game, but I think the third one, they'll they'll fix the mistakes of the first one, or the second one, I mean. Uh, Grand Theft Auto 5 obviously is going to be the big one that we're all excited about next year um, but yeah there's not really anything coming out this year I'm super excited about last year was an amazing year it's probably my favourite every year in gaming but this year there's not that much stuff I'm really hyped about I don't know what are, what are you looking at and thinking this looks awesome uh, I'm kind of in a similar situation I'm hmm looking at the current crop of stuff and going, yeah, there's not all that much that I desperately need to get my mitts on. Um, But I will confess, before we started the interview, I was, um, I succumbed to temptation and watched a couple of making of videos for Aliens Colonial Marines. Oh, yeah. Aliens was another one of those, I think, the the same (laughs) people in in our group. It was one of those formative experiences and... Uh, I think many. I think many can relate to that. Yeah. Um, I think, although I think I'm getting a touch jaded as to um, the amount of people who sort of just like took the um, the superficial enjoyment of aliens of just you know the colonial marines being awesome and uh, wanting to sort of yeah. to their shoes um, started getting a little bit over that. There is still part of me that you know heck does love the original and best and uh, yeah. does want to sort of. Especially the amount of detail they l- it looks like they put into um, uh, recreating LV-426 
and the Hadley's Hope Colony, mm. there's just this part of me that, yeah, I, when I when I get a game, one of the main things I guess I get it for is just the chance to go somewhere that I normally couldn't go and uh, do things that I normally couldn't do and just mm. opportunity to visit that place. Um, mm. And yeah, yeah, you've this, you've the same philosophy as me into why you game then. And uh, you know, everyone has their everyone has their reasons. Some people play to be competitive, or some people play for a challenge. But I, I'm I'm like you. I play to just escape for a while and go somewhere kind of mysterious and wonderful. You know. Yeah. And um, yeah, there is this part of me that is actually you know on one hand you look forward you play these action games to be a badass, but then again there is this other part of me that is kind of looking forward to standing in the middle of a dark corridor where the lights are flickering, hold <laughs> yeah. track of when it's making that you're screwed, you're screwed, yeah. screwed, yeah. Um, and you know, <laughs> being the opposite of being a badass, being the guy who's, you know, counting up the rain. Run away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm... I'm hanging out for that, but yeah. Aside from that, I'm. Um, when when is that game out, actually? Uh, it, from the looks of it, it's going to be early next year. Oh, okay. They've, cool. They put it back a couple of times. I think they announced they finally announced a date of it being sometime in February 2013. Cool. Actually, it's nice. It's nice to see when they they are taking the time to do things right. You know, it doesn't happen enough these days. No, sadly. I think I think many many games. I won't mention any of this names but a few games this year i think a lot of people wished had had a few more months spent on them especially certain parts of certain games <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so i remember there's a there was a lot of uh displeasure at the uh, deus ex human revolution when it came out over the um the boss fights oh they- my god <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite games of all time. That and Jesus Christ, those boss fights were just misery. They were pure misery, <laughs> especially for a stealth character. Oh well, I can't. I don't, again, it's spoilers, but yeah, the last level wasn't great. But ninety percent of that game, wow, absolutely masterpiece. I thought. Well, Gavin, I think that pretty much brings us to the end of the interview. So uh, once again, cool. it thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. It has been good fun talking to you about music and uh, has. making a career out of your passion and yeah, yes. it's geeking out with you about games as well. <clears throat> of course, yeah. <laughs> That's the most important part. <laughs> so once again, thank you very much. No problem.